Fans have been glued to their seats for five years straight as they follow the Black Lighters through each season of Outback Opal Hunters. They've spent a lot of money and worked hard for a year, but they still haven't found their big score. Even though they've made some interesting findings, they're still not happy and keep digging to find their elusive prize. Let's look into how Black Lighters show rare crystal opal, kingstones, and other items worth $24,000. Black Light users find fossils of opal, kyanite, and bellumite. The Brave team leader, Mark Ianson and his crew, which includes his grandson Xavier, Paul Kuhn, and John Nassar, have dug up tons of dirt to get to the mine tunnels. With eager eyes, he told the team what they needed to do to start their new quest. He said they were going to work on the mine shafts with someone else. They were going to take down the roof and the beams and empty the tunnel properly, seeing it as a huge risk that could pay off or not. Mark was busy while they worked, sitting behind the wheel of Black Lighter's six-ton grater and taking in the clouds of dust that filled the air as they dug. He keeps going, even though it's hard for him to see. He says that the whole thing is like having 20 knots blow up in his face 40 times an hour while he loads. As he talks, the wind mashes up his words, and more dust blows into his face, making it hard to see anything. He doesn't let that stop him, though. He goes about his business as usual, and because he can't see, he keeps running into Opalzilla until its protective side covering falls off. He tells the team that they don't have to all work together, but Paul Kuhn does help get it back up. Paul says it wasn't a good idea to leave it lying around because of all the dirt they were working with. It could roll under the belt and get in the way, or it could even fall on someone and hurt them. Paul puts the protected plate in place with a soldering iron. Fixing it right away is important, because if you don't, dirt will get in the way of the belt that brings dugout rock to the lab where ultraviolet rays find any opal minerals, and the work that was done was a temporary fix that worked, even though it wasn't perfect. As they do their day job, they keep digging through the walls to see if there are any differences in color that could mean there is opal there. Marx tells Paul that he sees some color. They dig at the rock with a hand digger until they hear a breaking sound. Opal in Australia was made when silica-rich water from an old inland sea seeped into the ground through cracks and holes and hardened in the host rock over millions of years. As they dug around the area where they heard the crunch, they found colors in every hole they dug. Because he is so excited, Mark shouts to the rest of the team they are with today. Mark talks about the rock's colors. He says that over a million years ago, opal flowed from the top and filled the whole area. He says that polished opal looks good at first, but will look even better after it breaks a bit. No matter how small it is or how deep it is buried, Opalzilla will find it. As they load their finds into the Opalzilla, he checks to see if John the operator is inside and lets him know that materials might contain valuable stones. John says that he looks through the rocks because sometimes a few get lost in the trash. He shows off some rocks that he picked out by hand that had been missed before. As he looks through the rocks, he comes across a golf ball that he sets aside. That's not all he finds, though. He also finds some bellumnite and describes it as a prehistoric relative of the old calamari, or squid. He has gone through almost all of the rocks that are probably more than 100 million years old and are full of opal. Then he finds what looks like the other part of the bellumnite she found earlier. He says in a funny way that Godzilla has its way with it, but that it will pay off to find a full bellumnite. He was still talking about how he was doing things when he said, Everything looked good in the dark room until you go outside in the light or give it a good wash. After that, you'll know if what was found was worth it. People who work for Blacklighter take their opal hauls to their home base where they wash them in a cement mixer that they've changed for three days. This process gets rid of all the clay until the opal color shows through. Mark is so happy with how things turned out that he calls the rest of the team to come see. He told them that he had put the stones in order of how good they were. He tells them to call Rachel an expert in appraisals. Rachel went to the table where the stones were being put in order after making sure it was the week's find. The colors found are nice to her. Mark says that they worked on it for three days to get it that way. As she looks at the stones, she says that the small ones are cheap and will sell faster at the market right now because anyone can buy them. She picks the kingstone to go even further. She says that the color is nice and bright. She also said they were the best because they were the right size and had thick bars. She says it was a beautiful blue-green gem that was very popular in Europe when she looked at the top. Mark says the kingstone came by itself and made a lot of noise. Boom! She picks up the bellumnite and continues to look at the finds on the table. Mark tells her that John found both pieces. They should hold their heads up, but she tells them to hold your heads up and praises their work. They found a lot of crystal opal, from small chips to big kingstones and a bellumnite fossil that has all the colors of the rainbow. The diamond, which weighs 566 grams, cleaned and tumbled with all the other finds. 
Rachel checks out the things on the table and says they are all worth $24,000. They all get happy and give each other high fives. Paul tells them that only some of what was found while they are celebrating. He pulls out a set of four golf balls and the winners head to the driving range to party. Paul tells everyone in the open field on top of the hill they use as their course to be careful not to get hit by the ball. Afterwards, he says, there wasn't much that could beat what they did that day. He said that the way he felt was pretty good. Xavier says the opal bug bit him and now he has opal fever. It was easy for him to get even though he wasn't very good at golf. Mark says that anyone would consider making $24,000 in a week a win. He was very pleased with the way he got back. Mark was really excited about the next hit. He was already very happy about the 24K. Opal worth $300,000 was found. When you fly over Cooper Petty, you can see an amazing view of a large area of land. But that's not the only thing that draws people in. Mark is shown putting the dig up on the 10-ton truck for the day. He uses a walkie-talkie to talk to John in the dark room across the field. John is told that he is working on a dump that he doesn't think has ever been touched. He will bring it to John to see if it is any good. John agrees with it. As Paul works on a part of the field, Mark loads up and heads toward John. They use Opalzilla, a 10-ton blacklight noodling machine, to look in mine dumps for opal that old timers missed. Paul says that while you're noodling, you should try to make something real because you need to make money to buy gas and pay your bills. Still, Mark says that a lot of people want opals for his business. The team chose to work harder, so they had to hire more people. While they are off from school, Xavier works full-time with the team with his friend Cooper Lines. Cooper says he has never been into the dark room, but he was nervous about going there with Xavier and John because he had heard that it made people sick. John talks to Cooper when he goes in with the rest of the team. He tells Cooper that they were looking for a nice glow on the belt. He finds one and shows Copper, whom he calls Coop, what it is. Cooper really looks at what is being shown and then starts his search. Xavier tells Cooper that they call it the Black Light, but it's really just a crystal on the belt that glows in the dark. He tells him to be careful with his hands and watch out because scorpions can come through and glow the same color as opal. Cooper tells Xavier that he is feeling a little dizzy by calling out to him. When Xavier asks him if he wants to throw up, Cooper does it on the belt before he can answer. He is told to go outside right away. When Rachel pops the cork on a bottle of wine, it looks better. Paul picks it up and sprays everyone with its contents, feeling happy and excited. This past season, the team and their families did well. Paul says they reached their goal and ended with a bang. They found Diamond worth more than $300,000. They were smart to use the money they made to look into abandoned underground mines. There is always more to gain for the Blacklighters. What do they find else? The Blacklighters have been determined to find expensive opals no matter what. There were many problems and failures, but they kept digging deeper and moving forward, never giving up hope. Finally, all of their hard work and persistence paid off when they found some beautiful, expensive opals. People with black lights find shells in Paul's new dugout home. Paul is in a tough spot. He needs a bigger house because his family is getting bigger. He chooses to buy one at an auction because he doesn't have enough money to buy it directly. Their room was tight, and he might not have had the best idea. People were stepping on each other and needed time to themselves. Mark says in a happy voice that he doesn't understand what was so exciting about winning an auction property since no one had ever done it before. Mark's house in Cooper Petty Town Center has a quiet side area where Paul, Mac, and John wait for the sale to start. The auctioneer starts by asking if anyone has a starting bid anywhere, an online bid of $43. Paul bids $4,000. Mark says yes and claps his back with joy. Mark says that buying and watching a sale on TV are two different things. His words are very strong. Bidder 30 puts in $4,300, and Mark tells Paul to go again. He put down $4,400. Mark is very happy and says it's so exciting. Because Bitter 30 is angry, he quickly responds. Mark asks what's wrong with Bitter 30 and why he was acting that way toward them. Mark tells Paul to beat him up and not let him get it. Mark is even more annoyed when Bitter 76 bids $5,000, so he asks where Bitter 76 is. Paul and John just sit there and don't say anything. Mark tells Paul not to give it to Bitter 76 because he will lend it to him. Paul puts in a bid of $6,500. When the speaker says that the house is for sale, Mark starts to pace quickly. Right away, Bitter 30 puts in $7,500, spoiling the moment for Paul and his friends, who thought they had it. Paul tries once more and bids $7,600. The speaker lets someone else bid on it. He counts to three and then says that Paul has bought it. Mark screams with joy and gives Paul and John a high five. John tells Paul, good job, and gives him praise. There is now a hole in the ground for him. Paul bought a cave dug out of an old opal mine in Cooper Petty. He takes his friends Mark and John to see it, and Mark tells Paul to mow his lawn. 
Mark told Paul that he needs a new couch. Paul says that he and his family made good money when they bought the house. Over time, they would build it the way they liked. It makes him think of the good old days. He says he will now take a shower without the water getting cold. As he walks through the building, he moans about a roof point that fell to the ground. Paul said it was unsafe, even though it was completely dry because it was breaking apart and falling to the ground. He feels a point and it falls to the ground, which proves what he already thought. It was dangerous. John says that the roof had to be made safer. In case Plan B doesn't work, Paul says he will dig out the whole cave and build on top of it. He will then work on the roof. As they looked around, they saw a spot on the wall with a gap that went all the way across. It was clear that someone had marked the spot to return, possibly because the ground around it didn't look right. With his hands still on the ground, John finds the first clue, an opal crystal. They get excited and run outside to get their tools right away. For Mark, Cooper Petty was the only place where an underground house could make money. Paul talks about whether or not mining is allowed. He says that you can mine your own home, but not if the house was bought just for mining and you can't mine in town. The only way to get away with it is to add onto the house. As they work with the power tools, the roof starts to fall in, and everyone agrees that they need to leave right away because the vibrations from the tools cutting away at the wall were making the roof fall. Mark says it's dangerous and doesn't make sense to work on the roof right now. Paul says that he is unhappy with how things are going, but that he is okay. He says it was to be expected since the house was bought on the spur of the moment. It was still home, though. He thinks of a way to fix the problem and says that they should rent a backhoe to dig everything up, cut back some of the hills, and hopefully find more crystals to make up for their loss. Looking more closely at what they had found earlier, they made the color look better. It was nice even though it wasn't from the mountains. They talked about how cool it would be to mine in the cave, but it's against the law in town. Still, it was enough to cover the sale costs. They agree to wash it and blow dry it. When they wash it, they find even shells with pretty colors inside. They found white and sparkling opal in a lot of lovely red, blue, green, and gold shades. It weighs 570 grams and is a mix of dirt from their Magic Mountain claim and Paul's new pit. They put it in order by grade and give it a value of $25,000. They're all excited about how the week is going. When Paul feels better, he asks, who buys a house and leaves with more money than they had before? Paul talks about how happy his wife would be while John calls it a good purchase. He says it feels like getting a house. They put in another bid because they feel lucky and want to win even more. Blacklighters get $62,000 for years of promise claims. At the land of promise claim for the Blacklighters, the team is having trouble with the loader because it stopped working. Mark calls Brett to get help figuring out what's wrong with the machine. Paul is angry because it's the first morning of the second week and they already have a $10,000 problem. Mark says that Opalzilla can't work right now because it's not getting any data and it needs the loader to work. This means that no money will come in that week until it's repaired. The week could have been better, and they had already spent $7,500 on gas to try to get to an opal level 12 meters below. John says that gasoline is pricey and that they have to spend at least $2,000 a week on it. They've already spent a lot of money to get here. He even calls the mine a money pit. Paul says that their goal for the year was 350,000 shares, and they have already made 46,000. It might seem like a lot of money, but when you split it up between them, it's not so bad. Rachel talks about the families. She says that there are three sets of families living in the house, which means that a lot of money will be spent. More scary, Mark says, if they don't find Opal, everything will stop and the game will be over. No more dream. John says Opalzilla is full and might not be able to work for a few weeks or months. It's very important to have a loader because it moves dirt with an opal from the open cut and feeds the blacklight noodling machine, which shines a blacklight on the opal. Paul says that Opalzilla buys fuel at the end of the week and makes sure there is food for everyone. To make things work for now, they use the digger. They have to make it work, even though it's slow, because they want to find something soon. Even though things are sad, Paul is on the backhoe and Xavier is driving the truck, and they keep working hard to get as much dirt as they can. Mark gets out the hand tools because they're going to keep going no matter what. He tells them they can start digging the rocks on their own. He says this week will be hard. The loader still doesn't work after $10,000 was spent on fixes. Mark walks away angry and says it was a waste of money. The Blacklighters are using their 20-ton backhoe to clear dirt to get to an opal level because an important loader is broken. This is slowing them down to a crawl, though. Mark says that there are caves all over the place 40 feet below the ground. In the 1970s, Mines were known as underground. They are now going down to see what they left behind. It will cost a lot, he says, if it works and they find a lot of opal. Okay, then it was worth it. It was the stupidest thing they've ever done if there's nothing there. In order to describe what he was doing, Paul says that they were trying to get into their caves. He says they know opal was found there, so let's hope some of it is still there. 
He says they are going to work non-stop until they find more Opal. He tells Xavier he is ready to go after filling up his truck. Mark says they are interested in changes in the ground and marks. Quite often, the level they were at will have a stain in it. Mark says that there might be a level coming up as Paul digs. They have reached stained ground from all the gravel. Water with a lot of silica from an old inland sea drained into the ground, filling in holes in the porous bedrock and stiffening to form opal. As the saying goes, you can't rip it without someone checking, so Mark keeps checking. As he looks, he finds more marks. The rest of the team is told to look at that and the coloring. It's too bright to look at opals, Mark says. Once they turn on the black lights, everyone will laugh. Paul goes on to say that the opal in the cut can't be seen during the day, so digging at night is best, but they still want to see it. At home base, they washed, stirred, and graded it. John looks at a sample, and Mark tells him it has one of the best marks. He says the base is a standard white coupe, but it still has a lot of lost colors and moves. Mark connects with a friend on video call and says hello. He tells him that they have E2 from the open fields and sell it all over the world. His friend asks him how much he has. Mark tells them they have 10 ounces, and most of it is better grade. The Blacklighters have a piece of Cooper Petty White Seam Opal that has flashes of every color. It weighs about 280 grams right now. When Mark shows him the opal, he asks if that is the biggest one. Mark replies that the biggest one is a kingstone. His friend tells him that the one he was shown wasn't bad. Mark gives him $15,000 and tells him it's worth every penny. His friend tells him that he needs some time first, though. He also says that even though he knows the team worked hard, he needs to make money and that $7,500 was a good amount. Mark yells that his deal was only half of what was being asked. Rachel joins the talk and tells him that his price is too high. Mark makes fun of Rachel by saying, even the big boss is on you. He talks things out and lowers the price by $2,000, which brings it down to $13,000. He asks his friend what they think about it. He tells her he wants the package and makes an offer of $10,000. Mark tells the other person that $10,000 is still too little and asks if he can raise the offer to $12,000. After giving it some thought, his friend offers to pay 12 ks if they could get a bigger package. They agree, but first they will call him to look at it. The deal is made and everyone is pleased. Mark tells him that his clients will love this stuff because it's so pretty. They thanked each other, and then the call stopped. Mark told the team in the room that everything was fine while giving John a high five. He still thinks the diamond is beautiful and calls it beautiful stuff. They say it's nice to get their money back because this week has been pretty scary. As they enjoy their win, they raise a glass to the hope that things will keep going. Back at the claim, the tunnels are still being dug, and they have been for a long time. Mark says that getting down to where they were has been hard and drawn out. That makes it hard to sleep at night, he says. It cost them about $35,000 to get here. He is upset that money is leaving his account but not coming in. He says things were getting really stressful. They soon got a break when they found a tunnel. They can't help but show how happy they are and sigh with relief. Mark says they can move the giant machine over. They carefully look for more tunnels to find out where they can drive, because if they don't, it will crash. They have to go backwards to be safe when they find another hole. John and Xavier go down into the hole to look around in the pipes and figure out which way to keep going with the open-cut mine. John tells Xavier to be careful of anything sketchy. To shave, he shows him what he should be watching out for. He says that when big chunks come falling, you know something is wrong if one lands on your scene. John points out an area where it's not quite tight. He says that if water hit it, the whole side would fall down. John is scared that they might have taken out all the good stuff already. After putting in so much work, it will break their hearts if they don't get anything. Xavier says that the cave is very deep and hopes that they find Opal. As they search some more, they went to the other side, which was very crowded and didn't leave much room to move. In their search, John found a shell. They're happy, give each other a high five, and then go back to tell the rest of the team. Mark says the ground was the bottom of the ocean. He went on to say that millions of years ago, they would have been underwater. When the water evaporated, all the sea creatures settled to the bottom, leaving a perfect mold of themselves on the ground. The silica that ran down filled these perfect molds, making the shell that looks exactly like it did when the animal was alive. Paul tore the mine roof off so the team could safely get to the tunnel with the opals. His words are so strong that if he hits with too much force, the whole roof could fall down. It was dangerous, but they like to take risks. Mark says he thinks the ground will give way at any time. They were doing something very dangerous. They feed Opalzilla dirt after they dig. Marx asks John if he has anything coming through yet. John says it's been pretty disappointing so far, but they still need to get all the stuff out there. He finds a cockle shell and another one soon after. John is very excited and calls it a shell party. 
His answer on the walkie-talkie is rodeo when he asks the other people on the team how they would feel about fishing for water in the desert. John and Xavier come out of the dark room with their prize chest full of things. The black lighters have completely colored opal crystals and shells that look like opal. It's broken and weighs 340 grams. Xavier tries to make his first sale with Sanan, a frequent buyer, but only if the deal says it has to happen in Adelaide, which is 840 kilometers away from Cooper Petty. What do they want to achieve with it? Xavier asks. Mark replies that they want to get as close to 60 as possible. Mark loves the business, but he knows he won't be in it forever. That's why he wants Xavier to learn everything he can about it, and selling is a big part of it. Xavier says he's pretty scared because he's never done this before, and not many 16-year-olds will ever do it. Sanan is told by Mark that he should take a break and let the boss handle things, pointing to Xavier. Sanan turns his chair around to face Xavier and asks what he has for him. Xavier gets his package out and shows Sanan what it is. Sanan puts it out on trays and says it looks good. Xavier then says that they have 12 ounces of full cockle. Xavier says that the price he wants is $70,000. Sanan tells him again that the amount is wrong and that even though it was his first deal, it wasn't his and wasn't worth $70,000. Xavier replies that he should look at the quality. He makes his $40,000 offer. While they're still bargaining, Xavier can't help but sneak looks at his dad. They finally agree to pay $50,000. Mark says it's scary to try to sell a bunch of opal to someone who does it all the time. He tells Xavier that he is proud of him and that it was a great attempt. Xavier is proud of himself for selling at $50,000. They've reached their goal for the year, which was $132,600. The Blacklighters are always on the lookout for better grounds, and they often have to travel long distances to complete their missions. To get to new claims, they sometimes have to drag big tools, like the Opal Zilla, the top of which is very heavy. They recently went on a trip through the hot desert around Cooper Petty. It rained a lot and was very hot, which made the trip harder and turned their path into a rough gold track. Even though their equipment broke down, Blacklighters found Opal worth $30,000. The whole process of moving Opal Zilla was a nightmare for Mark. He feels bad about what he did and hopes he never has to do it again. His mind has been heavy with it, and he can't get rid of it. Not even when he's in bed at night. The place where they are now is enough to keep them financially stable, but more is needed. To meet their wants, the weekly income they make needs to go up. Mark says that his life is like the old song, you have to know when to run. They chose to rent another car, this time a bigger truck, to help move Opalzilla so they could move on. They are set on making it work and moving on to bigger and better things, even though it's not easy. John comes out to help them drive the rental loader, which is about four times as heavy as theirs. Mark says that theirs was a six-ton and the rent was 21. They would go along with Opalzilla's choice to roll. He says the work is not fun and that the weight is very important, so they don't fall over when towed on these roads. Mark leads the way and John follows suit. Mark tells them to follow him and to let him know right away if something goes wrong. Paul tells them he will drive behind them to make sure everything is okay, and the two groups continue their trip. As they drove, Paul talked about how dangerous the road was and how simple it would be to turn over. Mark tells them to be careful because the ground is getting rough. Paul says that the hopper bin made the top of the tow vehicle very heavy, which makes it tip over. There were no repair shops along the path they were taking in case something went wrong. He says that if Opalzilla gives up, it will be a nightmare and a huge loss. Mark tells the people behind them that there is a hole in the road and that everyone needs to be careful because even one wheel going into it will make a mess. As they go through the hole without any problems, Mark can be seen looking back to make sure the rest of the team is okay. When they finally got where they were going, they checked the equipment and saw that one of the air conditioners was broken. It got loose on the way and fell inside while they were traveling. Mark says that he hopes it was still working even though it was upside down. To see if it still works, Paul puts it back where it came from. When John turns on the power to check the air conditioner, they find something even scarier. Opalzilla told her not to come on. Each switch didn't have a light on it. They get to work right away to fix things. Paul told them that it was time to change the 240 wires because they hadn't been changed in 10 years. As time ran out, they hoped they could get the machine back up and running soon. The power comes back on in Opalzilla after hours of fixes and new lines being put in. The air conditioner that had fallen over was still running. If John was right, they were too happy because the light in the dark room wasn't turning on yet. John is upset that one problem is making another one happen. The belt didn't work at first, but it was saved after a few turns. Someone set off the emergency stop, which John sees as the reason why it's no longer working. When Marx asks who it was, they say it wasn't them. They are upset that two hours were lost because someone pushed a button. 
Right away, they load the Opal Zilla with rocks and dirt that they dug out. In the lab, Mark tells John to get the rocks in order, so everything is okay. He talks about what they had coming through the protector's belt and what they had before. He thinks their chances are better now. Soon, stones will be seen shining in the dark room and they will be put in the bucket after being sorted. John said it was beginning to happen, even though he thought it would be slow at first. He takes his bucket outside and shows it to the other people on the team. They are thrilled about what they've found. When they get back to their house, they wash the stones well and spread them out on a table with a sieve. They are even more excited about what they have. They got crystal opals that weighed 900 grams and had some of the colors cleaned up. Marx asks someone how much the find is worth and says he will not take less than $30,000 for it. He tells them to think about all the jewelry they could make out of the crystal opal. He yells, it will be huge! He is thrilled to say that he worked for six hours and made that much. They are all thrilled to live in Magic Mountain. Paul is excited and asks, will you tell me where in the world I can get that? Mark says, nowhere in the world. He then praises his team's work and says they were the best people to work with. He looks at his stepson, Xavier, and tells him that every day he is getting better, learning new things and doing great. Paul jokes that Xavier should leave and go back to work during the party and award ceremony. Mark brings in a barrel of beer that is cooling on ice because he is in a good mood. Paul plays with Xavier's hair and tells him he should have a soft drink instead of a beer and wait until he can have one. Mark talks about how stressed he was about the move and how good it felt to make so much on their first day. He says they could have moved all day and felt nothing. He talks about how he felt, tingly and happy. As they raise their glasses in celebration, it's not just the $30,000 prize that blows their minds. The full-spectrum white opal is worth $12,000. Mark is shown running to the dark room after Paul tells him that they have found something. The joy doesn't last long, though, because it turns out to be Potch. Potch is colorless, opal, and worthless because the silica spheres inside are jumbled and don't scatter light like precious opal does. Instead, the spheres are uniform, which turns light into color. The smallest spheres make blues and purples, while the rarest and most valuable reds come from the largest spheres. If it had been a different class, Mark says, it would have been worth an extra $100,000. But since it was Potch, it doesn't matter to them. John asked the team if everything was okay outside because he was out of rocks and the Opalzilla wasn't getting fed. He was told to stop everything from the other end. The rock feeder belt's bearing was torn, which stopped the main roller case and cracked a weld on the belt's axle. John says fixing it will be hard and take a while, so they get to work fixing things. Paul shows the crack going all the way around and says, let's go, it's game over, if that's the case. After this accident, the Black Lighters have to fix Opal, their old noodling machine, which is their only way to find her. They need to replace the important front belt roller drum, Mark is describing the process. He says that they had to take out the end drum in order to move the belt forward enough to take out the front drum. Now they have to do the opposite to get everything back in, which will be hard, but they manage it. There isn't much room for change, so only a small adjustment needs to be made. Paul says they're missing out on finding lots of opal, but they can't do anything about it because Opal Zala would help them find it. He says that Opal Zala is the key to their business, so it needs to be up and running. Working together, they put on the front roller, they are now working on the back one, but Paul doesn't think it will work because they would have to cut the belt. They are going to use the 6-ton truck to stretch the 100-kilogram belt enough to get the roller back into place. Mark says it's just a matter of whether they can get it through. He says they are facing a nightmare every time they do a bearing. He says they call it the Opal Fields Bearing Rage, and it will hit you at some point. That moment was theirs. To set things up, Paul hurts his hand and yells at the person who made the machine, You bloody idiot! Finally, they got it to work. John said that Mark was more excited than they were, and Mark agreed. Mark was also very happy. Paul and John called it a win for them because Opalzilla is back. John says it looks good right now after checking the work that was done. Time will tell, but it looks good for now. Paul says it's good that they were able to fix things and that finding Opal will make the week better. He says it would be nice to get some of their money back since they had already spent so much. The Black Lighters are now keen to find at least $10,000 worth of Opal so they can buy a digger to grow their business and start open-cut mining. John hopes that the repair work on the digger will keep it running. Mark says that getting it out of the yard won't be easy, but they have to find a way. Paul finds some green in the dark room. Things are looking up. Their first few buckets were getting a little colorful. So let's keep going and see if they can find some money today. As Mark talks about where they are, he says that Paul is starting to get some material in the dark room. It sounds like things are getting better, and that's all he will say for now. They all say goodbye and give each other a well done as they head home. They start washing the rock right away in a homemade tumbler made of two empty powdered milk tins for two hours. This will get rid of the sand and clay, revealing any opal underneath. 
Mark shows up with a package and says that it's part of their stuff that fell up north. They got rid of all the dirt and chose the best. The black lighters have white opal with all the colors of the rainbow. They're rough, weigh 2.5 kilos, and are worth $10 to $12,000 a week. The other pieces on the table still had a lot of stones that needed to be sorted out. Even with everything that happened, they finally won, and the money from that win paid for the excavator. Mark tells the team that, just when they think the week is over, they should keep working until they get something that turns things around. After digging hard for several days, the black lighters were able to find a lot of opals. They weren't sure what their hard work would lead to, but they decided to put their faith to the test. To their surprise, they were shocked by how many opals they had found. People who use black lights make $46,000 at auctions. Paul is shown below telling the team above that he found a seam on the wall. Mark is thrilled and says, We have color! Mark says they plan to get to the main caves where the old timers were and dig a huge cut there. He says it will be the biggest job the black lighters have ever done. To get to the tunnels, the black lighters dig a 100 meter long open cut that goes down 12 meters. Mark explains how it will work and says that they will open it up, take the walls, roof, and floors, and empty it. Paul is working on a machine outside. He says that while noodling and Opalzilla will pay the bills, it won't get you rich. He says that the open cut funds are the big pocket because that's the only way to get rich. It cost $20,000 to dig up the new mine. The two brothers, Paul and John, talk about how to dig up the new mine. At first, they say it's pointless to spend a lot of money on gas to dig up dirt from ground level to about 40 feet. It's almost payday, but business has been slow. During the mining season, Mark's underground house in Cooper Petty is shared by three families. Rachel, Mark's wife and the person in charge of their finances and online sales, tells the team that they have had a rough time and that family is what drives their business. She tells them to go for it and makes their goal of $350,000. She says that they are running out of opal and appreciates the work of the team to get to the point where they get something. How soon does that need to be made clear? Mark goes even further and says that there will be no sales and no team if they don't find opal. Mark tells them that they need to keep looking for opal because the loader couldn't handle the job. The team also can't dig their open cut and run opalzilla at the same time, or they might not have any opal to sell at the upcoming sales. To solve their problem, they took a chance and spent $10,000 on a used dump truck. Mark says that now that they have the truck, all they have to do is fill it up, and the work will keep going until they get down. Paul finally shows up after going to buy the truck. Xavier is put in charge of driving the truck while Paul works on the digger, Mark on the loader, and John in the dark room. Back at home in Cooper Petty, the team cleans and grades the found opal before the sale. Rachel says that 35,000 people from all over the world follow them online, which is a good sign. Now, Rachel says that the business is their only way to make money and that they have to keep mining while the team gets ready for the live auction. The black lighters make a crystal of crystal opal. The color ranges from small flashes of blue and green to a full spectrum of rare red and three large kingstones. The packages have already been broken up into many small pieces and are marked in dollars. They are now ready to be auctioned off. Mark says they're live and gives the floor to bidders with a reward for everyone who bids quickly. Their first sale is to Ben for $30, and as promised, he gets a prize. They then sell another package to Zach for $85. Rachel said that things were going pretty well and that people who saw them online were happy with what they had to offer. The small parcel is sold for up to $1,500 until the stone of the night comes up for sale. Pedro buys it for $6,600, stopping the bidding. Rachel adds up all the money and finds that it comes to $46,000. She congratulates Mark and says that the sale was one of the best times of their lives so far. John says the amount is fair and should get them some fuel, which is a great way to start the season. Paul praises the team's work and tells them to keep going to get bigger and better. People who use black lights make $2,000 on new soil. With cash in hand, Mark finds Steve Bonaros, the owner of the excavator they've been after. They greet each other, and then Mark shows Steve to the rest of the team. Steve then tells them to check out the excavator. Everyone is excited when Paul starts the engine from behind the wheel. John says the engine sounds good, Paul says everything looks like it should, and Mark agrees that it doesn't look too bad. They were joking that a new one would cost at least $150,000, but the Blacklighters only have a small portion of that amount to spend on the 20-ton excavator. Mark says they'd like to pay $10,000 and save some money to fix it up, since it's pretty old. But they will have to wait because things that cheap don't come up very often there. As soon as everyone agreed, the team went up to Steve and told him they wanted to buy. Mark led the negotiation and asked Steve how much he was asking. Steve said he wanted to get around $17,000 to $18,000,
because the machine was in great shape. And Mark agreed with him that the price was fair. Still in talks, he tells Steve that they were offering $10,000. But Steve turns them down right away. The Blacklighters are in a tough spot because they don't have much money to buy the much-needed digger. Mark says that everyone in Cooper Petty is good at negotiating, whether it's for a claim, a piece of machinery, or oil. He tells Steve that their budget was $10,000, but he thinks that might be a little low. Steve tells Mark that he briefly talked to his brother about it and that they were willing to sell it for $15,000. Mark agrees with Steve that that price is fair and then goes to talk with Paul and John. And Digger is an important part of their larger plan for open-cut mining. Overhearing their conversation, Mark says that $15,000 is too much for them. He also knows that $10,000 is way below the asking price, so they all agree on $12,000. Steve reassures them that it is a good machine and that he is sure they will find some opal with it. The whole team and their families are really excited about the purchase and all the new opportunities it will open up for them. They all celebrate by giving each other hugs. The Black Lighters have been stuck without opal for another week. Mark, Paul, and John are now moving to a place they think will be more productive, but it will take a lot of work. Paul says the claim is rubbish and they would have been better off not going there in the first place. In order to finish the job faster, they hired Xavier. Mark says that Xavier will help them out and do what he wants, which is to learn everything. He'll be interested in it later. Xavier is being asked to help them move their huge 10-ton processing plant, Opalzilla. He pretty much cleared out the other side, so all that was left to do was clean up this side. As he talks about his work, he lists what he has done and what he still needs to do. He says the tires are hidden, and it was hard to get rid of all the dirt. For three months now, the Black Lighters have been working on their bed frame. Dragon's Lair says it's a win-win situation because they made just enough money to buy a used digger, which was a long-held dream. When they bought something, they were excited. Mark says this will give them a chance to take the next step. They want to find a really big pocket, but it's still very hot, and the season is almost over. So the Black Lighters are still well short of their goal, and now the opal on two of their four claims has dried up. John says that Dragon's Lair helped us near the end, when they got a few pieces, but that sort of ended. Paul said that they left the bed frame and said the place was dead. He is glad to be out of there himself. Mark says they should move to Jess's ditch because there is some dirt there. They could go there right away, but there was a 700-meter wide, rough, sandy track that they had to go through. They get ready to leave. Paul tells Mark that there is a slight slope in the back, so he should keep going when he starts to move. Opalzilla is 10 tons, 5 meters wide, 13 meters long, and top-heavy. Mark's six-ton loader is connected to it with a homemade hitch made of bolts and shackles. Mark says that their pin setup could be a lot better. Paul will need to keep an eye on that and stop if it starts to move or come loose. Mark starts the trip and Paul tells him to keep going. When Mark gets close to a soft spot, Paul tells him to be careful, and Mark does. Zilla could lose control if the bolt in the tow hitch falls out. Paul says they can't undo the chains because too much pressure is on the pin, so they'll have to run with it that way. Mark keeps going and carefully looks behind him to see what's going on. On the walkie-talkie, Paul can be heard telling him to keep going straight down while Mark asks him to keep talking to him and asks if they should line up behind him. Mark says that moving Opal Zilla is very dangerous because it's not the most stable machine. He has to be careful not to go too far around the sides or over the edges, making little cuts. Paul keeps giving him directions and cheers him on while keeping a close eye on him as he follows the moving car on foot. When he makes it through the small open-cut mine and turns, Paul tells Mark. Mark says that the trip was the best thing they have ever done. They finished it in one day and will now pump up both machines. He went on to say that they would have the excavator in the morning and then Opalzilla going at full speed. They would definitely be moving a lot of dirt. Mark congratulates Xavier on the win and tells the team that they are off to a good start on the job. He says that they keep forgetting what they could get from Jess's cave because they have been there before. He says that the opal was beautiful and that they didn't have a digger back then, so he thinks that, now that they do have one, they could finish that off properly in the last few weeks of the season to try to reach their goal. The Black Lighters use their newly bought backhoe and Opalzilla, their processing plant, to go after land they've been on before. Mark explains the process and shows where the new land ends and the old land begins. He points out a big piece of rock and says it's full of the good dump, which is where they used to find nice stuff. They couldn't get to that point with the loader back then, but with the digger, they could just pick up the already dug out pile and run it straight through Opalzilla. That should have some good stuff in it. When Mark talks to John and Paul, he tells them that they can get some stuff if they get good at running it. Since Opalzilla has been out of commission for three weeks, the Black Lighters have had to try a new way to make money. Mark says they want to break down that wall that night and use the black lights to look inside. 
They fault the ground where things have been seeping down over it for years, which makes a place for the silica to seep down and form a pocket. To find opal inside, they use small black light torches and their new digger to follow a fault line in the dark. John says there is some kind of running little seam inside, and he goes on to show them where they were in color. Mark still works and tells Paul where to dig. He says the ground is hard, so they have to go lower inch by inch to get through it. Mark asks John where he saw the seam and then points John in the right direction. The lights are turned off so they can get to it. While Paul works on the digger, he worries that John and Mark are too close to the bucket. He says that if the dirt cracks and gives way, the bucket will fall on their heads. They worked hard and got lucky and they hit it big. They are so excited that they look through their finds in the dark. Mark picks up a piece and says he can't wait to see how it turns out after being tumbled. They found valuable Cooper Petty Crystal. It's in bad shape and weighs about 200 grams, so it's worth about $2,000 USD. They were ready to go home, so they stopped working and promised to come back and make even more money. Have any ideas about what will happen next? Tell us in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and follow for more cool videos like this.